house. <laughs> and, and so uh, immediately, knowing my mother, as, as I should after 44 years, well, it may have been more like 30-something back then, but uh, uh-huh. as I knew, uh, I knew to immediately start looking around because something, she had seen something, and it's going to be funny as soon as I find it. And so I'm looking around, and sure enough, there on every table is this little plaque that says, hand-dipped ice cream. <laughs> so this is uh, this is my mother's sense of humor, but it also had a more serious purpose because this was how my mom ingrained in all of her kids a sense of alertness and awareness of watching um, the world around us. Because sometimes, if I had seen that first, I could have done the same thing, and she would have laughed and or my brother or whoever was with us well this uh, this is also really close to curiosity and just a sense of wonder in the world and it was this quality that attracts me to uh, all of my best friends are insanely curious and not just the original sense but they're also very curious people <laughs> so um, but that's good. That's a good thing. We need curious people in the world. And so that it's that sense of curiosity that attracted me to this story about a young man. Um, I originally heard this story, uh, and uh, originally, uh, the way I heard it, uh, the young man was hit in the head with an apple. Um, so. In 1666, Isaac was scared of the plague, and so he decided it was time to move out to the big city where most people were catching the plague, and uh, move out to the country. So his mom still lived on the family farm, and he went out there for a while, and there were apple orchards. So Isaac Newton did not get hit on the head by an apple, I have come to find out. Uh, Although he was out in the orchard one day, in what he actually termed a contemplative mood, um, when he actually did see an apple fall from the ground. And, oh, nope, fall to the ground. (laughs) See, that would have changed the whole theory. That's an important point in the story, right? (laughs) So, thank you. (laughs) So, he saw an apple fall to the ground from the tree. Thank you. And uh, it was one of those moments. It was one of those moments where everything he had been thinking about a coalesced, just kind of came boom, and he thought to himself, why? Here I am in England, I've been in Europe, I've you know, I've, uh, maybe he's been to other places, but he can only assume also that, you know, throughout, all throughout the world, apples fall straight down. Why straight down? Well, the original answer, the, the, the traditional answer of his time was that uh, everything falls down because that's, it, it, that's its nature. Its nature is to be close to the earth, go back, everything wants to go back to the earth, so it falls down. But he'd heard this newfangled, at the time even, uh, he'd heard these newfangled ideas that the world might be round from Copernicus and Galileo. So Isaac was thinking, you know, if the world was round, then everything and, and, and if all apples are falling straight to the ground, that means that they're all falling towards the center of the earth. So, okay, that makes sense. I, you know, that doesn't disprove their theory or prove anything, but, you know, that's something to think about. But the bigger question was, what pulled it down? When you think about a rock in a field, those big boulders that you have to get out of the way so you can farm that field, The only way that rock is going to move to the edge of the field is if something pushes it or pulls it or, you know, something has to act on that rock. So what was acting on that apple 
when it fall when it when it comes loose from the tree, why doesn't it just hover or go up? <laughs> why does it just why does it go down? It must be some kind of force. There has to be something that's pulling it down. And so he started talking to his friends and through red letters, whatever, you know, he, he started talking and, and, and people started talking about gravity. It was a good name. Everything's going back to the grave. It was pretty, you know, that, it kind of took on the traditional, took on the traditional term and people knew it pretty quickly and easily. And it turned out that that was a stunning idea. Everybody was impressed and it made everyone curious. He was contagious. <laughs> or Ebola. <laughs> but in a good way. So one of his friends noticed, um, well, okay, the first thing they noticed actually, uh, generally, was, well, okay, so yeah, it works close to the earth, apples, it pulls apples down, and obviously when we jump up, we go down, and that must be the same force that's pulling us down. And, um, but what about farther out? You know, there's these new ideas that the planets are spinning around each other and around the sun, and what if it's gravity that's holding all of that together? And they, you know, and so, so people started wondering about that, and one of his friends said, oh, well, guess what? I've noticed. If um, something's farther away, if you're thinking of like that, you know, these bodies, if they're farther away from each other, they don't seem to have as much influence on each other. And Newton was like, yeah, that's true, that's true. And so, you know, these ideas kept building one after another. Okay, so what What else, what else? And, and somebody else said, oh, um, the bigger ones, the big ones hold, up, hold things on tighter. They, they have a stronger pull than the smaller ones. And uh, Isaac was like, yeah, oh yeah. And if you put those two together, he got this little neat mathematical equation that could predict where the planets were going to be at certain times. And it was a stunning set of equations. And it just kind of proved that the Earth was going around the sun, and the planets were going around the sun, and the moons were going around the planets. And in fact, he predicted so well that uh, when they were watching Neptune and measuring, or no, when they were watching, nope, the one right before Neptune, Uranus, when they were watching that, they noticed it wobbled. It didn't follow the right path. And so immediately someone said, oh, there must be something pulling it off course every so often. And that is how they discovered Neptune, the next planet. So it was pretty cool, you know, and, and his ideas were so good that they lasted for 300 years before anybody else noticed or got curious about the subject again. They, they thought he had done it. That was it. That was what held the universe together was gravity. Well, the problem was Mercury. <laughs> that little tiny planet that is closest to the sun, when they first when Newton first came up with these ideas, they realized that um, they, they weren't measuring very specifically. They, they didn't have the equipment to measure very precisely. And so it basically followed, but then every so often someone would go, hey, Mercury's off again. <laughs> and uh, they couldn't quite figure this out. So, well, somebody else, a young man named Albert in 1940s, he heard about that Mercury problem and it made him curious. And he said, he thought to himself, what, why, would, why would Mercury run different? And so he talked to his friends and, came and, and thought about the ideas. And he realized that these, these huge objects like the sun were so huge that they were doing a couple of things. They were bending space and they were slowing down time around them ever so slightly. And it, and it took 300 years before we had the instruments to precisely measure that. But he recalculated and kind of 
fiddled around with um, Isaac's theory and, and formulas, and all of a sudden, Mercury started doing what it was supposed to again. Well, Mercury itself hadn't really changed any of its plans, but we kind of understood what Mercury had been doing all along, finally. But, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but I got to the end of this story once, as I was practicing, and I realized we still don't know that second question. What's, what's pulling the apple down? Yeah, we call it gravity, but what is it? What's gravity? Makes me curious. Now, the other thing I realized was that the sad thing about science stories is they're almost always cliffhangers. <laughs> <laughs>